Hi, everybody. Welcome to service. We are glad that you are joining us wherever you find yourself. Welcome to Online Church here at Faith Community. Uh, as always, we love to start our services with worship, uh, with singing together, bringing ourselves together in unity as we worship our God. Uh, but, of course, we like to start by uh, um, confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. So we're going to do that now, say these words together wherever you're at, and then we're going to dive into singing together. So let's say these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
That is our prayer today, God, that we invite your spirit, we, ins- we invite you to be with us as we worship you. Father, we know that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us as we worship, as we dive into your word, as we gather together in community together, even when we're uh, separated by screens and being online and in different locations and as the world tries to get back to normal, God, you still show up. And as we worship together, whether we're in the same spot or the same building you are there. Your presence is there. And so I just pray over uh, this time that we have together, um, that you would move in us, you'd open our hearts to what you have for us th- today, uh, the words you've laid on Pastor Lucas. I just pray that uh, you would move through them, you'd speak through him, um, so that we can hear your voice clearly and know you more at the end of the day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. with me to a hillside just outside of New York. 
It's a balmy evening and we are standing in an enormous crowd numbering upwards of 100,000 men, women, and children. It's just before midnight on October 22nd, 1844. All around us, there is this low buzz of whispered voices as men exchange stories of how they've sold their homes and are given up their jobs or abandoned their farms to be here. An almost tangible air of expectation hangs over the gathering. And standing at the top of the hill is a lone figure. His name is William Miller. And most of the eyes in the crowd are trained on him. He is their leader. He is the man who has spent years studying the prophecies in the book of Daniel and has predicted the second coming of Christ at midnight on this day. Needless to say, midnight comes and goes and slowly, sadly, certainly, and reluctantly, the crowd begins to drift away. Some who have wagered their entire livelihoods on the truth of Miller's words, they hesitate just a little bit longer looking up to the sky, expecting at any moment that they will see Jesus in his own words, the Son of Man in the clouds with great power and glory. But as we know, that didn't happen. Most people will never remember the events of October 22nd, 1844. It was later termed by the, termed by the followers of William Miller as the Great Disappointment. Misguided he may have been, misled he patently was, one thing we can be certain of, he was not mistaken in his attitude. Christ will return, and whether it's on a hillside outside of New York or on top of the Rocky Mountains, we will all see his coming in glory. When we are thinking about the end times today, does it cause us to live with hope or does it cause us to live with fear? That's what we're going to be talking about as we're diving into Mark chapter 13 today. But before we jump into our text, I just want to say this. If you've ever, ever had a moment in your life where you think, I am discouraged, I am depressed, I am afraid, I am anxious, and, and I think I'm just going to read the Bible. And you do one of those things where you, where you flip through the pages of the Bible and you randomly put your finger down somewhere. If you come to this page, chances are you're probably going to flip again. I'm just, just saying. There is a ton of intrigue over this passage. And for a lot of people, there is a lot of fear over this passage. So as we come to this text, as a disclaimer, there are a lot of questions that this passage raises, and I do not have enough time to answer all of them today. But my prayer is that we will see that this is exactly the passage we needed today as we flip through the Bible looking for something to bring us hope and to encourage us. Now, I want you to imagine this. Imagine dropping into the middle of a conversation that happened over 2,000 years ago. Jesus is having a heart-to-heart -heart with Peter, Andrew, and James, and John, the fishermen. It's a Tuesday evening. They're sitting on the Mount of Olives, about a quarter of a mile outside of the walls of Jerusalem. Now imagine the sun setting behind this 35-acre complex as Jesus talks to them. Jesus' crucifixion is three days away, but today is a peaceful, quiet spring evening. Sounds peaceful, right? But then hear what Jesus tells them in Mark chapter 13. I mean, just look at the heading of this chapter. The destruction of the temple and signs of the end times. That sounds peaceful, doesn't it? Well, let's jump in. Mark chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. It says this. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. There's a lot in there, right? You see, we are living in strange times, aren't we? 
We hear this passage and we hear about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. And then we turn on our TVs or even if we just walk out our front doors, we see all of those things, right? We see kingdoms against kingdoms. We hear, we hear of wars and rumors of wars. We hear of earthquakes. And we can even add to this list hurricanes, a worldwide pandemic. And on top of that, this past year in the midst of the pandemic, there have been wildfires all around us. In fact, there was a family that our church helped during that time. As they, they watched as their house that they loved burned completely to the ground in five minutes during the Callwood fire, they barely made it out. And when I dropped off a check from our pandemic and wildfire relief fund, I asked them what that experience was like for them. And they said that it was apocalyptic, right? The sky was dark, they said. The smell of smoke engulfed us, and it looked like the end of the world as we know it. You see, if you read the, the newspaper in one hand, and then you have Mark 13 in the other hand, you may look around and think that this is the end of the world. And if you're thinking that today, it is easy to understand why. You see, I felt like that, and I'm sure many of us did, in September 2012 during the 100-year flood that happened here in Longmont and in the surrounding area. I remember a sheriff deputy coming to my house and telling me and my wife that we had less than 10 minutes to gather up some stuff and to drive out of our neighborhood before it would be flooded and impossible to get out. I, of course, ran and I, I grabbed my firearms, I grabbed my electronic devices, I got in the car and I realized I forgot the dogs, right? So I had to run back in, but I failed to pack any clothes. It was just, it was a crazy, crazy time. It was one of the worst floods that Longmont had ever experienced. Roads were flooded. People were climbing to the tops of their roofs because their homes were flooding and there wasn't anywhere to go. I remember not being able to make phone calls because the cell phone towers were overloaded with calls. And I'm sure many of us were thinking during this time that this is the end of the world as we know it. We are captivated by end time stuff, aren't we? Think of all the movies about the end times. They captivate our imagination, which also means that it captivates our fears. And the sad thing is, is I think many people capitalize on that. It's why during the pandemic, we went out and we bought all the toilet paper we could get our hands on because we were afraid that we aren't going to have something that we want or that we need. When we think about the end of the world, it can cause us to live with a lot of fear. I remember when I was younger and those left behind books started coming out. And I remember after reading one of those books, I, I started praying, God, God, please don't take me before my baseball game this weekend. It's the playoffs, God. Please, God, don't, don't come back uh, before the Chiefs win the Super Bowl or before I get married or have kids. When we look around at the world we love and start thinking about the end of it, we can become afraid. And what do we often do when we are afraid of the end of the world? We build bunkers. I don't mean that we necessarily literally build bunkers, although if you have a bunker and, and the end of the world is coming, then I pray that anything I say here today won't cause you to be offended and exclude me from your bunker. I will gladly accept an invitation to your bunker. You see, we build bunkers because we want to be protected. Now, you might be watching this online and you might be thinking, Lucas, I don't have a literal bunker. I'm not afraid of the end of the world. That's not what keeps me up at night. But I'm sure other things do. Maybe you're afraid of losing the things that you love, losing your health, losing your house or your job. Maybe you're afraid of rejection or betrayal or failure. We may not have literal bunkers that we run to for help, but we have something that we go to to keep us safe. Maybe for some of us, it's, it's the best kid, school for our kids. Maybe it's the, the best job with the highest salary for us. Maybe we run to our retirement funds for safety. Maybe it's relationships, or maybe it's addictions. I'm not sure what that is for you, but chances are we all have bunkers in our lives that we run to for safety. And even though we have these, we never feel quite safe enough, do we? You see, the temple was kind of a bunker back during Jesus' day. It was a safe place. It was a strong place. In fact, we just read that the disciples are telling Jesus how great all the stone buildings were around them. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem and seen the Wailing Wall, I had the opportunity to go there with our church a, a couple of years ago. And, and there's going to be a picture here on the screen. I want you to look at the, the, the stones of, of this wall. You see, you can see these giant stones that were left over from Herod's addition to the temple. 
And history tells us that he actually quarried stones that were 100 tons in weight to bring them to the temple. And some of the stones that you can still see today are over 40 feet wide. The temple was a strong house, but it wasn't just a strong house. Even though it had the appearance of a fortress, it was also a place where heaven and earth met. This was a place where God dwelled with his people. And think about this. The disciples, they probably had a ton of memories at the temple. Maybe they were, were remembering all the times they worshiped there with their families and participated in the festivals. Even Jesus as a young man. We are told that when he was at the temple, he was in his father's house. When his family lost him, I, it still baffles me that, that Jesus', Jesus mom and uh, earthly father lost him, right, for three days. And when they find him, he says, you should have looked in the temple. Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? The disciples had these memories of these times where they had seen prayers answered. And maybe they were remembering times where they had celebrated or times where they had mourned in this place. Maybe it was kind of like for us when we have memories of a church camp that we would go to as kids or memories at a church where, where we truly felt like we experienced the presence of God in some powerful ways in that place. The disciples also had these past cultural memories of the temple. They remembered miracles that happened in the temple, and they were probably thinking about Jesus' ministry in and around the temple. What does Jesus do when they are in, are in the presence of this special and sacred place? Jesus says, these stones, yeah, they're pretty great, but these massive stones are going to be turned upside down. This place is going to be destroyed. Now, I want you to put yourself in their shoes for a moment. Think about how terrifying that would be for them. This is the most sacred real estate on earth for them. They probably would have died to protect the temple. And now Jesus is saying every stone is going to be turned upside down and destroyed. This whole time they've been making their way to Jerusalem. And they're thinking because of their beliefs and their culture that Jesus is just going to march into Jerusalem. And he's going to reform the temple. They're thinking that he's going to reform the temple by bringing right worship to Israel and by restoring their nation to the rightful place that it should be. And so when Jesus says that this temple is going to be destroyed, it probably felt like the end of the world as they knew it, as their political, cultural, and religious memories and dreams and hopes are being turned upside down in this moment. This here in our text is a prophecy from Jesus. And in fact, that is exactly what would happen. If you read history, you can hold up Mark 13 next to the writings from the ancient historian Josephus, and you can see the exact things that Jesus prophesied about the temple actually happened within a generation of those he was talking to this about. In 70 AD, the Roman army seized Jerusalem, and because of this, the people starved. People actually resorted to cannibalism. Josephus says that half of the city was running with blood and the other half was on fire. People were in the tunnels looking for safety. Josephus said no city had ever seen such destruction as Jerusalem on the day when it was destroyed. And on that day, a false prophet within the city told everyone to get to the temple. This is the end, he said. That he's, God's going to save us. God's going to open up the heaven and bring us up with him if you get to the temple. And so people flocked to the temple because that was their bunker. That was their safe house. And on that day, the temple was destroyed and everybody in it died. But what happened to the Christians who believed? What happened to the Christians who heard Jesus' words later on in Mark where he says, if you hear of this happening, flee the city and run to the hills. A church historian close to this time period speaks about how the Christians remembered Jesus' prophecy and fled to the hills. And much of the Christian population of Jerusalem were spared because they heard the words of Jesus and believed. And get this, after Jerusalem was destroyed, they scattered all over the known world. Through Jesus' prophecy, through the destruction of the temple and God's judgment on the temple, God saved his people and built his kingdom on earth. You see, Jesus has a way of taking our safe houses, our bunkers, our strong places, and turning them upside down. This is what grace does when it transforms our lives. Grace is free and unmerited, and we are saved by no work of our own, only through the gift of grace given to us by God. 
Yet, that grace is costly. It can be disruptive. Because grace comes in and it judges our faults and our false hopes and our idolatry and turns our lives upside down. It causes us to think differently about how we love other people, to to think differently about money and power, sex, families, relationships, and work. When Jesus comes to us and when we are transformed by grace, some might say it is the end of the world as I know it. The old has gone, the new has come. I think one reason that it can be hard to have hope for how great the future will be and to not live in fear of the end of the world is because for some of us, we feel like life can't get any better than it is right now. If you're a parent, you know this situation. You plan something really fun and awesome for your family, but they have zero interest in doing it. This actually happened to me recently, just a couple days before Halloween. We were planning to, to take Lily to a really fun event for kids And as we're getting ready to leave, we're telling Lily, this is going to be a great event. She goes, no, I don't want to go. I want to stay here. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's going to be candy. You can wear your Rapunzel costume. It's going to be the best thing you've ever been to. Lily says, so what? I want to stay home. Get this, I had to pry her fingers off the front door like a good father and carry her kicking and screaming to the car. She couldn't imagine the fun that was about to happen. And that's the thing about imagination. That's the thing about hope and the future. It works both ways, fear and hope. You see, it's much easier for us to look at the future and be afraid than it is to look at the future and be hopeful. It's sometimes harder to imagine the future when the present seems so good. Like Lily, she's she's like that. That event might be great, but it's in the future. This right here at our house, this is what I want. And we do the same thing. When God tells us about his kingdom and the goodness that he has for us, and even the good that he has for us right now in this life, we think, I don't want to lose the things that I have now. There isn't just a prophecy in this passage. There's also a promise. Look at verses 32 through 37. And and in these verses, we start to see the conversation change a little bit. The disciples hear Jesus talk about how the temple is going to be destroyed, and, and they think that this is going to be the end. And they start asking, when is this going to happen? When's the temple going to be destroyed? And look at how Jesus answers that question. Starting with verse 32, it says this. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether it is in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, don't let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Jesus is saying, yes, the temple will be destroyed, but that won't be the end. You see, we today, we have the advantage of history on our side. We can all say, well, the world didn't end in 70 AD. The world is still here. So all those things weren't the end of the world. So Jesus is answering the question of when the temple will be destroyed and when is the end. And he says, nobody knows the answers to those questions. The angels of heaven, they don't know. Not even the son. Only the father knows when the end will be. But what he does is he promises that the end will come. He will return. And in that promise, there is hope. In these verses, there is a tremendous amount of hope for us in the coming of Christ as he promises us. Not just that the temple will be destroyed, but that he will come back. Because Jesus says that his body is the temple. And the temple of his body will be destroyed and raised to life in three days. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John gets an insight into the true end. And in chapter 21, we see how when Jesus returns as promised, John says that Jesus will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. Have hope today. Jesus is the rightful king. He is the one who receives the everlasting kingdom, the dominion that lasts forever, a kingdom of all nations, all tribes, all languages that belong to Jesus. 
Jesus is king. And this should give us an incredible amount of hope and comfort. Because this means that Jesus is sovereign over everything. When we today feel like our lives are completely out of control, when we turn on the news and feel like there's nothing I can do to be safe enough from everything that is happening in our world, know this, you have a king who is in control. Even if you feel out of control, he is in control. There is nothing on this planet that can surprise our God. There is no war or disease or disaster or earthquake or famine or pandemic or wildfires that our God doesn't know about. And the truth is this, none of those things can conquer our God. He is a victorious king. He will be the king that lasts forever. Our king is coming. He has come and will come again. And I pray that promise would give all of us a posture of expectant hope. And I pray that that promise would cause all of us to say, let that be today. Come, Lord Jesus, come. This world in all of its glory pales in comparison to what is to come. Because in that kingdom, there will be no more temple. Because God will dwell with his people and everything that is cursed, humanity will be gone. We have a kingdom in heaven that is promised to us that cannot be shaken. Let this promise cause us to have an expectant hope, to not be afraid about the, about the end, but to be joyful for what is to come. There is a party coming, and when it comes, every pain, every sorrow, every shame, all the duplicity of our hearts, all the times that we do the things that we don't want to do and don't do the things that we want to do, all of the fears and anxieties of life, the threats, the betrayal, the failures which hangs on every moment, the marital strifes, bad bosses, and the sin that corrupts everything we do, the self-doubting, the, the self-loathing, all pride, all the lust, greed, gluttony, violence, and bigotry of this world will be over when Jesus returns. If we can just wrap our minds around that, we won't be afraid of the end times. We won't be afraid of anything that happens to us in this life. We won't cling too closely to our safety here, but we will live with an expected hope, praying, come, Lord Jesus, come. Because when he comes, we will be home at last. May the thought of the coming king fill us with hope as we proclaim the end of this world as we know it to a dying world that desperately needs to hear it. Come, Lord Jesus, come. God, we, we pray that today. God, we thank you for the hope and the promises found in your word. God, that remind us that we have nothing to be afraid of in this life. God, because what is to come is something that we could never imagine a place filled with no more sorrow, no more pain, no more guilt, no more shame. God, may we live with hope in that today. May we rest in that, and may that cause us to live in peace in the midst of such a chaotic world today. God, I thank you for your love and your grace for us in our lives, and that nothing can separate us from your love. I pray these things in your name. Amen. can't wait for eternity join the song they're already singing holy 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 are you Lord just bow down before your throne see your face I cry out because you're holy Stop.
standing with those who have heard well done, proclaiming forever that you're the one who's faithful, faithful, faithful are you, Lord. Oh, what can we give you but endless praise? The heavens roar as we shout. continue in worship let's pray uh, praying for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs gracious God we are grateful for this day that you have given us and this season where we can take some time um, even in our culture to be thankful and to remember all that you have given us and today we especially rejoice in the good news that we've heard from Pastor Lucas and the reminder of the hope that we have and that we are uh, in your care and in your love and that will be for an eternity and so we give thanks for that reminder today of the hope that you give us uh, as we come along alongside you and uh, continue to be a part of this family and your work and your kingdom. We just ask that you would continue to work through us and that you would take all that we have and use it to grow your kingdom. So today we offer you um, our time and ourselves and all our, of our things and we do pray that you would use it uh, for the good and the growth of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also confess to you today that we are sinners and we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Hear us now as we confess to you from the silence of our hearts, our sin, and our brokenness.
God, thank you for your promise of love and mercy and grace uh, and uh, through all of that, uh, this offer of forgiveness. And so we thank you that we can stand before you as your forgiven children today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We think today, too, of all those people who are sick and suffering, those that are grieving, those that are heavy-hearted. We ask for you to lay uh, your healing hands on them as we pray for them by name. God, again, we just ask for you to surround them with your love, to give them your peace, uh, and to, to lay on them your hands that bring healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we gather online together, we remember that it was in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. Would invite you now to take whatever elements you have to represent the bread and let's take it together as we remember that this is the body of Jesus given for you. As they continued their meal, then Jesus took the cup and he again gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. And so now if you would raise your cup with whatever you have in it and remember that this is Jesus' blood given for you. Let's pray using the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bring your worry, grief, and pain. Every cause you have for shame, lay it all down. Lay it all down. When your cares and 
buried you And there's nothing left to do Lay it all down Lay it all down At the feet of Jesus At the feet of Jesus Carried on, but your heart was tied. Feared the worst and felt the fire. Lay it all down. Lay it all down. Filled with all those anxious thoughts. All your doubts became your God. Lay it all down. Lay it all down. On better days, our memories we can't erase. Lay it all down, lay it all down. We've come to fear what we can't explain. There's nothing here that can ease the pain. Thank you for being a part of worship today. It's always great to come alongside each other online and to be able to reset for whatever lies ahead in the next week or so. So uh, we appreciate you being with us today. And we're excited about uh, as we move into the holiday season, there's just a lot of good things going on. So we'd continue to encourage you to check the website and see what those latest things are. A couple things are surviving the holidays, which is happening Tuesday at 6.30. 
to eight o'clock. And we know that this time of year can be hard for a lot of people. And so if you're grieving or this just is a time of year that's really difficult for you, we'd invite you to come to that free event. And it's here on site at the church. And then Thanksgiving's coming up. And so we will have a Holden Thanksgiving Eve service followed by Pi Fellowship and on the 24th of November. So we'd invite you to come to that too. Uh, and we'll be meeting here at the church at six o'clock. So we'd love to have you be a part of that too. So again, thanks for uh, being here to worship together today. And we just pray for you as you head into your week. And as you go, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.